In this episode, I am once again joined by David Johnson, meditation teacher and author of A Path to Nibbana. In this episode, David describes the forgiveness meditation technique that he teaches to his students who encounter emotional blocks in meditation practice. David recalls his own journey with forgiveness, including his experience of forgiving a toxic boss, and shares his students' accounts of using this technique. David also explains the links between keeping Buddhist precepts and a peaceful mind, and details other benefits of a moral life, including an increase in personal power and acquisition of Siddhi. So without further ado, David Johnson. David Johnson, welcome back to the podcast. Hey Steve, it's great to be back. Let's let's talk. Well, Steve, I thought that we should change things up a little bit today. Uh, we talked a lot about uh, meditation and the effects of meditation and you know, kind of going into the weeds there. But there's something that is getting in the way of meditation that uh, everybody has a problem with. And that is uh, emotional blocks. And uh, what the solution to that is, is forgiveness meditation. And Bhante Vimal Ramsey actually came up with this method. And it's the thing that's different with this is it is a method. I mean, you know, we've got a book. The forgiveness meditation is probably reverse, but forgiveness meditation, it's documented how to do it. So let me tell you before we get into that, why why we want to do this. So Bhante teaches uh, metta meditation or loving kindness. We feel that that is the path to Nibbana, uh, not to mention my book name, but um, metta has a couple of benefits. Well, first of all, it's gets away from the breath and the body and it gets into the gets into feeling. Most people don't uh, they're not in in touch with a with a feeling. There there a lot of people have meditated with the breath. They're used to going to that. They have habits develop. So, Bhante is using loving kindness uh, or metta to develop this uh jhana this unification of mind. Now, the advantage of metta is, is it feels great. Um, it's a happy feeling. It is a, a feeling, and you feel it, and you feel happy. And your mind can, it, it, it can enjoy that feeling, and it doesn't wander off. Whereas with the breath, it's very dry. The breath is coming in and out. You have to pay, put a little extra effort to notice that breath coming in and out. But with metta, it's enjoyable to do it. Um, but some people have a problem with that feeling, bringing the feeling up. And they are very likely to be blocked in some way. They are experiencing... Things like when they have a phrase that I, may I be happy, they think to themselves, I don't deserve to be happy. I just, uh, I can wish somebody else happiness, but not me. And we'll see people come in and they'll, they'll be crying like the second day. It's like, I, I just can't do meta. I don't, you know, I don't feel it. And I'll say, you know, I'll ask them, what do you, why? And, and well, I just don't. I don't see myself as a happy person. I've never been happy. And they actually tell me, I have never been happy. And I said, okay, all right, I get it. Um, so let's try something um, different. So let's try some forgiveness meditation. And what forgiveness does is it softens all of these things that come up in your mind. It addresses them directly. Now, we have a process in the meditation where we use this process called the six R's. It's basically when a hindrance comes up, you just release it, relax, re-smile, come back to your object. Well, in this case, they'll have emotional things coming up, and this is just not, it's not enough to handle it. So what you have to do is you have to go at these emotional blocks on a personal level, not at the impersonal level. 
forgiveness is about personally forgiving whoever wronged you or forgiving yourself that you wronged yourself and you forgive yourself. It's personal. It's not the not self of just seeing these emotions coming up as painful feelings, which they are. They're just painful feelings and they have a story attached to them, a memory. And then that balloons out into more stories and that balloons out into things that they do. And then they're going to go eat ice cream or they're going to go and distract themselves and, and all the rest of it. Well, if your mind is strong enough, you can catch that painful feeling arising and relax and it'll dwindle down and you can handle your emotional blocks like that. But not everybody can do that. There's a lot. Uh, I taught forgiveness retreats for a, a while online. Right now, I'm pretty busy to really get involved with that. But I taught forgiveness. And uh, Steve, let me tell you, there are stories out there that you cannot believe. People suffer like their entire lives. Their, their parents, their bosses, their uh, teachers, their children, everybody it feels like is going after them. And in, and in in many cases, uh, they do. I mean, they get hit, they they are abused uh, in every which way. Uh, it's like everybody's got a story, and um, so that's really driving them. And it's been pushed down. It's like, no, I'm fine, but no, you're not fine because there's no feeling of loving kindness. There's no feeling of happiness. And so we have to soften and start to let, peel away these onions of, of pain. And so this forgiveness practice, what it does, is very simple. I mean, your listeners could probably benefit. I can just explain it in about two minutes, and they can just go off and do it. And what you do is you just sit down. This is not about concentration or a fee, or or locking in on a feeling or 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 getting concentrated on anything. It's a contemplative um, thinking about your life. But what how you do this is you give yourself a a phrase. I forgive myself for not understanding. I forgive myself for having caused myself pain. I forgive myself for having caused others pain. Now, this is an open-ended statement. It just allows your mind to fill in the blank. I forgive myself for not understanding why that teacher in third grade came after me, why my boss doesn't like me, why blah, whatever comes up. You just let these things come up and then you forgive them. You take a few moments, I forgive you, you see that person, or you see yourself, and you forgive yourself, and relax. Two steps, forgive, relax. And the relax is stopping that emotion from continuing. When you, that's, that emotion is craving. It is wanting to make something happen in a certain way. It's a feeling, and so we relax. We forgive it, we relax. Now, we don't go dredging around for things that we think that we have to forgive. We let the mind come up with them. So one of our students is a hypnosis, um, uh, regression hypnosis therapist. And what they do is they take, the, the student will come in or the, the client will come in and say, you know, I'm a really, I'm afraid of, you know, drowning. Okay, maybe afraid of, so she said, okay. And she puts them under and she says, I want your mind to take you back to when the problem happened. Well, they don't know. And so she'll, the, the client will get a memory and it will be maybe of being a sailor on a boat and falling overboard. And and then the, the therapist will talk, talk her through that and just help her to experience that fully. And then she comes back out of that, and that that fear is diminished or gone. And so what she's doing is just saying, mind, go back to the problem. And it does. 
I don't know why, but it does. So that's what we're doing with the forgiveness. We're letting the mind go find the problem and let it go. Now, I did this meditation myself, and I'll tell you, it took a little while because I, I ended up with this boss. I used to work in Silicon Valley and high tech and all that. See, I, I call it high tech. That Nobody even calls it high tech anymore. Now it's, I don't know, tech, whatever. But I was in that world making networking uh, equipment and all of that. And we had a uh, we had a, bo a new boss. It was California is very laid back, you know, you know, little ties and all that. No, 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 we don't. We didn't do that. And that that was going out when I was working. So we had a new boss from the East Coast. East Coast, eh, they have a different attitude. It's like, guys, you're going to come in at seven a.m. and leave at seven p.m. or eleven p.m. or whatever it takes. You're going to get the job done. Well, that just really graded on all of us because we were tending to be more like eight to five and everything is relaxed, you know, and everything's chilled out. And I mean, I know this isn't true for a lot of programmers, but we're not programmers. And so uh, she and I, I worked for her. I was a, a manager and we got into some tussles about this. And finally, she just ripped me in part, uh, apart in front of everybody. And it, it was really humiliated. And I, 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 I subsequently, I mean, I continued, but later on, I left. I said, there's got to be a different place to work. And I did. But I held on to that, that whatever happened, I was really upset with her for a few years. And I left the company. I was still upset. And when I got to into the meditation world here, I learned about forgiveness uh, with Bonte, and I did some forgiveness. And I thought, okay, I'm I'm fine. But then she'd come up again. So that's another key point. If this person comes up again, you got more work to do. So I every time this person would come up, I would forgive them. And every time they come up again, it just took a few years. And I, and finally, one time, one time I was sitting with Bonte uh, watching the interviews uh, and he talked to them about doing forgiveness. And I thought, and there's that person again. And I forgave them. And all of a sudden I had this kind of chills. My body was shaking and I understood her point of view. I got it. I thought, oh, I mean, I thought I understood what she said, but I understood where she was coming from. Every It all dropped and it was over. Now I can think of her, give her some loving kindness, understand her, be compassionate. Everything is fine. I don't have that emotion come up. And that, uh, I think it solved a lot of other little issues too. The mind tends to get stuck on one thing and if you can go after that one thing, it tends to just take care of everything else. One guy, I was doing a retreat here just last week. I put this guy in forgiveness. He went for a few days. Um, nothing really much happening. He, he, he did do some crying, and we encourage that. We're the only re retreat center that encourages people to cry. Because if they feel it, let it out. It's okay. Don't suppress it. Don't control it. Also, but don't get carried away and indulging, indulging it. Just let it disappear. And so he had a few good cries and he came back. Finally, the third day, he said, I had this amazing experience. It was as though there was this column of light that went up. And every problem that I had ever had was attached to that. And it just all stopped. And from there on, he didn't need to forgive anymore. He thought he should do some more. But I said, no, I think you're good. I think you're, it's time for you to do some metta. And he did. And he, he said, I feel the feeling now. I feel that feeling. Now, I do have a few little short little things I could read from people who did the practice, if you uh, like a little testimonial if you want to hear some of that. Yeah. Um, 
Okay, so this guy is in Germany. Secondly, I will go on retreat at the end of October. And in preparation for that, I have been practicing forgiveness meditation daily for the last three months. I noticed how I used guilt to manipulate others and how I let myself be manipulated by guilt a few weeks ago and stopped a lot of it, it seems. So great effects. I had sessions where I felt tremendous love and a lot of tears came. Also, I noticed how forgiving specific things in my mother tongue, German, released lots of tension in the stomach. Here's another one. Hello, Dhamma friends. I have been doing forgiveness almost all day for the last month or so and have been feeling amazing levels of relief. My father and I have unfortunately been on very bad terms for all of our lives because of his extreme anger issues and alcohols, alcoholism problems since I was born. However, during a small conversation the other day, for the first time ever, I was able to tell my dad that I am genuinely grateful to him for giving me life and supporting me as a young child. And that was almost, honestly one of the first times I've ever seen him smile. So these people are just taking the practice, going off and doing it themselves. It's quite easy. Now you can do a walking meditation. You forgive yourself for not understanding as you walk. And you forgive other. You can change up your phrases. I forgive others for having caused others pain or having caused me pain, because others may cause you pain. There may be a bully, and he comes and hits you in the face or takes your lunch money. Well, people don't want to forgive him because what he did was wrong. It is wrong, no doubt. However, he's not doing it from right understanding. He doesn't understand that if he continues to do that, he's going to create a lot of trouble for himself. Not only he's going to feel some guilt, some remorse at some point, but he may have somebody come back at him and who's a lot bigger than him and beat the heck out of him. So he's not understanding that what he's doing is really wrong and is going to hurt himself. So we have to forgive him. And that's the definition of compassion, is understanding other people's suffering, but loving them anyway. That's the definition of compassion. So we forgive them for not understanding. We forgive ourselves for not understanding, for any foolish things that we've done. And we let that come up for that 30-minute sitting. And a lot sometimes there's going to be nothing at all. Sometimes there's a lot of stuff and you just keep forgiving. And if you have to get a, a towel to cry into, that's fine. And when you're done, okay, you're done. Now, um, you might have to go for two, three, four days. And at, when you're doing that, forgive everything. When you get up in the morning, you don't feel so good, forgive yourself for not feeling good. If it's dark in the morning, like it is now, forgive it for being dark. Uh, if, uh, you know, whatever it is, forgive, if in doubt, forgive it. So just fill your whole life for three or four days with forgiveness. And so from then on, you start to develop a habit of, instead of acting with anger or emotional upset to things, your mind will now give you, oh, I forgive it. And so you completely change your perspective to how you should react to things. And so I, I would encourage everybody to give it a try. I mean, uh, at our website, we have uh, pages and talks on forgiveness at damsuka.org. And in the back of my book, the forgiveness book does, um, it, I put that in there. That's in the path of Nibbana. Thank you. That's very interesting indeed. I wonder if you yeah. might give three or four, if you want, of the best examples of the phrase that one should use three or four stock phrases. You've already said, I forgive myself for not understanding as one stock phrase. I wonder if you might give just two or three other stock phrases that you, you think are particularly good starting places. Sure. I forgive myself for having caused pain to others. I forgive 
others for having caused me pain. Um, I forgive others for not understanding. I forgive others for not having loved me. I forgive myself for not loving myself. So these are emotionally charged things. And the hope is they'll bring up some of your personal stories and you'll remember things you had not remembered for a long time. You'll go, yeah, it happened, but somehow it's been pushed away out of my consciousness. Um, does that does that help? Yes. And what sort of rate should one repeat the phrase? Uh, once a minute, once a second, and when something comes yeah. up, do you adjust the phrase to uh, address what's coming up, or do you just keep the, the standard phrase going and allow whatever comes up to sort of happen? No, uh, no. Uh, all you're doing is you're just reminding yourself of of what you're doing. I forgive myself for not understanding, and just let it hang in the air. See what happens. You might stay a minute or two minutes. Nothing comes up. Then say it again. Only use it to just kind of nudge things along. And that, that, that just to get a little bit off track, that can be a little bit of a problem with other types of metta meditation where all they do is they say phrases, may I be happy, may I be free from suffering. May I be healthy? May I be safe? And they just repeat them, repeat them over and over again. Well, that's not really going to develop any kind of feeling. You, you repeat these phrases to bring up things. It's not a mantra. So that's kind of a criticism of people just repeating phrases about loving kindness. That it, it, it's very nice, but it. it the idea is to bring up the, this feeling and to actually feel loving kindness. So in the same way, bring up the phrases as necessary. And for possibly long periods of time, there won't be anything that comes up. And and meditator will come back and say, well, nothing's happening. And okay, do you feel anything? Do you feel loving kindness? Do you feel like, no? Well, the thing to know when you're done is that you, if you ask yourself, is there anything left to forgive or are you done for now? And if your mind says, no, I need to keep going, then you keep going. And a lot of times, if there's something um, that is, if your mind says, I'm good, it's going to say it and you're going to go, yeah, I, I'm good. And so, okay, the mind knows, it knows everything. Um, and then you just you just go off to another. However, it doesn't mean you don't you can't use forgiveness as a tool. You just use it uh, when things come up. You know, you go into work. You're not in meditation or anything, but your boss, you know, kind of gives you a rundown here, and so you're going to forgive him for not understanding. But you're gonna you're going to forgive. But you're also if you're if you're at fault here. You're going to forgive yourself for maybe making a mistake. Oh, that's another good phrase. I forgive myself for making mistakes. Because we do. You know, we do things wrong out of laziness, out of not being smart enough, out of... Um, so if it's not intentional, it's not a big deal. But if it's intentionally kind of knowing the results are not going to be good, let's forgive ourselves for that and not do that anymore. In the Buddhist tradition, the Buddha, a monk would do something wrong. And there was a, um, uh, a forgiveness um, method. They would, they, they would, the Buddha would call the monk. The monk would come in. And the Buddha would say, explain what happened. And uh, they would explain it. And the Buddha would say, do you forgive or we forgive you for that in this order, as long as you understand what you did wrong and that you will do everything right in the future. If that is the case, we forgive you and you know, please move on. And everything is good. 
sometimes monks would come in and say, no, it was it was wrong and, or it was right and I'm not going to forgive it. And then, you know, they would be continue to be admonished or asked to leave or, or whatever it was, but or sent back to their preceptor. Um, but as long as you forgive and you understand what you did wrong, you know, all as they say, all will be forgiven. Is there an ideal uh, dosage in terms of frequency of sessions um, and duration of sessions? I, I suppose if you're on retreat, you just do it all the time. Is, yeah. this, is this the sort of practice you can do off retreat as well? Uh, and if so, what sort of dose are we looking at here? I know in your guide, you say 30 minutes minimum at the beginning of your meditation session is what you recommend. I wonder, is that true for daily life as yeah. well as retreat? How, how do you organize that? Yeah. Yeah, I would just do 30 minutes a day and and then bring that forgiveness into the rest of your day uh, as you're walking down the street. Forgive yourself for not understanding. But as at a minimum, just do one session a day and just do it do it for a week. I tell people do it do it for a week. Cuz then you develop this strong habit of reacting with forgiveness instead of reacting with anger or upset. Um, let's see. Yeah, this stuff can really um, be effective. Even um, I, I remember Bonte worked with soldiers who've come back from the war and they've killed people. And it's something they don't talk about. But um, he's worked with them and it's taken them a long time. Some can, can't do it. But look at this PTSD that's happening. I mean, 20 to 30 soldiers committing suicide, as I've heard that kind of number every day. Um, they go with the greatest intentions and they come back really wrecked and they're treated with drugs. So don't, don't treat yourself with drugs. Get off the drugs. Treat yourself with some forgiveness and then loving kindness meditation. Um, may I ask a question about that? Yeah. Um, I'm curious about now you mentioned that people who are receiving some sort of psychiatric care, for example, do you see a limit or a contraindication for this sort of a technique? Um, are there people? Uh, you good question. Yeah, that you wouldn't recommend yeah, it. Yeah, you've, yeah. You've, said here, you've just said here, get off the drugs. That, um, yeah. Do you mean to say that if anyone's on any medications, they should immediately cease them and begin? No, of course not. Right. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> but think about uh, not using the drugs as the only, only method. And the drugs are um, attempting to solve a problem and so let's find out what the problem is and see if we can solve that and i think with this method this is a very specific method you continue to do this until the stuff comes up that you need to forgive you forgive it you relax let it go and it's over now with psychotherapy uh I mean, changing the subject just a tiny bit over to psychotherapy, going in to talk to somebody about all your problems. Well, I mean, there is actually a lot of jokes about the money that could have been saved <laughs> from all those sessions because all they really ever accomplished was having a friend to talk to, and they never really solved the issues that were coming up. It was just talk, 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 and they never forgave, they never... It, it's helpful, but let's go to the go to the the root of the problem. Um, we do see people come for meditation retreats who are on, you know, the um, the happy drugs, if you will. They don't do so well. That med that uh, drug is actually suppressing the feeling, and when they when we ask them to bring up the feeling of love and kindness, they can't. It's just, it's just empty. It's just not there. So we'll put them on forgiveness, but then there's nothing there. 
and and we'll say are you you know are you taking a zoloft or anything like this we're not we don't want to get too much into this but we we're trying to help them develop the feeling and they say oh yeah we we've been prescribed that every day for since we've been you know teenagers and that's what we we take and so that's the problem so your original question is can we ha help everybody doing this no, we can't because first of all, if you're on these drugs, there's going to be a problem there. Um, you can do it while on them, but and and maybe you'll solve some issues, and then you can maybe reduce your dosage. Um, but some people, their minds are just not in a great space, and uh, we had one fellow come, and he was he, he was he admitted to us. Well, I'm bipolar and I just realized I'm having this, I'm kind of going into this mode where I'm just not tranquil. I'm not calm. I'm, I'm kind of manic. I think maybe it's just better for me to go and relax back on my house. So, okay. Okay, good. Because he, he just wasn't, he wasn't either at the point to be helped or, you know, and he understood that. And so it's very, it's not really common, but, we do keep a lookout for people who who might have these these drugs that are affecting affecting them. And is there any anything you might see in a student whilst they're undertaking this technique that might give you reason to pause it for them to say, "I think you should take a break from this technique." Is there something you might see that would 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 give you cause to say that? No, I would just tell them to continue give and maybe take it outside and go relax a little bit the problem is some people will get into their story and they'll, they won't relax they won't let go of of thinking about it and um you just have to work through that and you have to tell them don't don't indulge this some people want to indulge um they feel like there's somebody who's, who doesn't, who, who isn't happy. And so their, their definition of themselves is depressed all the time. Ever, ever met someone who says, well, I'm depressed most of the time. And I, I have a problem with depression. So my doctor's got me up. You know, it's, and it's fine. Really? It's fine? And, and they're just in this, this mode. And it's time for them to think differently that no, they can be happy and, and they can be different. So so we, we have to have them see that there's a different way to see things and to get out of that. Here's a question. And to do with forgiveness meditation and perhaps it's a broader question related to him also. But in particular, you said that Practicing this technique can change the way that one reacts to difficult situations, uh, angry boss, that kind of thing. The instinct is to forgive rather than, you know, to become angry or that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, you get used to doing that. I wonder, is there a danger of that sort of a training, turning one into a bit of a pushover? That mm. oh everything's okay it's okay to walk over me I forgive you etc cetera, etc cetera. where does if you want boundary function come in here does it come in at all or and how how do you see that whole like standing up for yourself how do you see that that side of things within this sort of framework yeah that is a good question and uh, it's been brought up and you know it's kind of it's been brought up a lot more with meta because if you give loving kindness to somebody who's yelling and screaming at you and you turn the other cheek, does that make you, you know, a wimp? Does that, does that make you a lesser person? Well, nobody said to get rid of your intelligence and to let go of, you know, your smarts. You, you understand what that person is saying. You make an intelligent judgment as to whether it's right or wrong. But there's never anything good about reacting in a negative way. It's just not going to help anything. You don't have any fear about going back to the person and say, no, that's not right. Here's what happened. And let me explain it to you. You let go of those fears 
um, uh, that many of us have about we don't want to get other people upset. If they're upset at us, upset, okay, no, your your mind go in there and it doesn't get stuck in these emotional spaces because you've let that go. Now everything's clear. Um, so the answer is no. That's you, you don't become a pushover. You actually eliminate your fears and your neurosis and you're just a very powerful person now you're kind but powerful uh you're intelligent but kind and no nobody's going to push you over you have no could you say something more about you said powerful could you say something more about that this this potency powerful it's it's really true that as you go through the meditative process and you eliminate the anger and a, a fear is part of anger because fear is pushing away and anger is you know pushing away too but in striking in, in a sense when you eliminate your fear you become powerful and it's not in the way of powerful wielding angry forces it's not through anger but it's through not being angry and not having any fear to um get get what you need um i used to have a fear of making phone calls to people i didn't i didn't know i was very nervous about doing that and i i i thought well i'll just you know try to not be fearful well, as I got through the meditation process, I noticed that those kind of little fears, they started to diminish, you know, and now, of course, you know, I can pick up a phone and call whoever and it doesn't, I don't care. Um, it's fine, um, uh, just as I'm supposed to. And uh, so that's the power and in and when you reflect on that oh i can do that now you feel powerful but it's not a negative powerful it's it's a very positive open awareness so open space where do those kind of fears come from in your opinion the sort of fear of calling someone on the phone social anxiety of various types um those sorts of those that sort of fear where does that kind of fear come from what's its root I have no idea. Um, it probably will be different for everybody. But if you want the Buddhist answer, the Buddhist answer is that your mind is full of unwholesome states because you've broken precepts in the past. You've done things that you are remor remorseful for. You've done things that you, you don't feel proud of um and you're guilty and these these things from the past will drive up in terms of fear i think one of the the the, the um, negative aspects of stealing is that is that you're very afraid of everything and you have a lot of fear so when you break the precept of stealing it doesn't sound like that that's what it would would happen but we if you steal and all this you're fearful and if you think about it yeah if you run out of a store with stuff in your hand you're going to be looking around all the time i mean you, you so as long as you have that stuff you're going to be looking over your shoulder for the rest of the time i i'll tell you i tell you, i had a little a little experience with that uh i just started learning this meditation when i was in like uh like 19 and um uh, somebody Somebody says, well, why, you know, you're just too stuck up with this morality stuff. And you, you can't, you're too attached to the rules. And I said, attached to the rules? Um, yeah, I, I want you to go and steal a battery or something from that hardware store. He says, well, I'm not attached to rules. I can do that. So, okay. So I went in and I put a battery in my pocket and I walked out. And I felt so guilty. I mean, like one little, it was a nine volt battery and uh, I stuck it in my coat and I 
thought for sure, like I had this big bullseye on the back of, on my back and the police were going to come and I went home. Well, the next day I took that battery and I stuck it back on the shelf and went out of the store and never doing that again. And it caused fear and uh, guilt and all of that. And I think from our past, those things come up. And it may be from other lifetimes where we've done things that are wrong. But the, you know, I would tell people that to stop all this need for forgiveness and hey, you know, you're going to, you might be doing some things in the future you're going to have to forgive. So let's stop all of that because there's no end to forgiveness if you just keep doing the same old stuff. Let's follow the five precepts. You know, those five evil moral things. Don't kill or harm anybody. Okay. Nobody's, you know, going to come after you if you don't do that. Or if you do that, don't steal. Don't lie. Don't don't speak harshly. Um, no sexual misconduct. That's kind of a given. No adultery. We don't want to run around with other people's partners. Um, and don't do drugs. You know, as, as as Nancy Reagan says, just say no. <laughs> I know everybody now is getting into psychedelics again and seeing them as therapeutic. And, okay, there have been some very good experiments where a small microdoses of psychedelics have been used. But I would tell you better is to just stop breaking all the precepts that are causing all these issues in your mind. And it's going to take a little while. It may take, you know, six months or a year for the mind to start to empty out all of all of these negative emotions. Um, but it will happen because when you do only wholesome things, you continue to develop a wholesome, happier mind. The real the real path to happiness is actually doing things that make you happy and other people happy. And then you can reflect, I guess I'm okay. I guess I deserve to be happy because now all you can think about is I gave to that person. I helped that person. I didn't react to that person. Now your, your reputation, your own reputation in your own mind starts to come up to, I guess I'm okay. Now, putting some forgiveness practice in there is is great, too, to, to really target some of this stuff. But if you're a moral person, you, you do good, you harm other people, you know, you're going to feel better and, and be happier. Yes, that's an interesting link in the Buddhist teachings between breaking the precepts and then disturbed mind states that come as a consequence of that. Not to mention the mm -hmm. uh, consequences in terms of the karmic consequences, I suppose, for future lives, uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In uh, your yeah. particular system, do you have a doctrine about the ripening of negative actions in future lives? in the, the particular ways in which that occurs? Do you have a particular doctrine on that subject? I know some Buddhist schools do. They say certain sorts of negative actions will manifest in certain kinds of ways in the next life. It, it, it's an option. Uh, do you have that sort of idea also? Yeah, I mean, I think everybody kind of knows what that is. I mean, you look in all of the sutta texts. Um, you know, if you don't give and you you're stingy, um, you know, you're going to be reborn as a poor person. You're not going to have money. Um, if you kill or harm other people, uh, it's said that the harming causes sickness in the future. The killing causes you to have a shorter life. Um, drugs, um, intoxicating the mind. It creates, uh, dull states of mind, sleepiness, um, lying, uh, causes your rep reputation to be a liar, to come to the forefront that nobody trusts you. 
whenever you say something, you don't have any impact. Nobody listens to you. It used to be years and years ago, before I took precepts, I got into Buddhism and I was just doing some retreats on the side and doing some things. But I was working at my full-time job and I would go in and we would have a meeting you know, with the other staff and there would be a problem and I would come up with a solution, which I really thought was the answer because I knew a lot about it. But other people would say, no, it's not that, it's this. And I would say, no, I really, I believe that it is this, here's the reasons, but nobody would pay any attention. And so I said, okay. And they would go off and they would do whatever they thought was right and it wouldn't work. And later on, I'd beat myself up saying, you know, I was right, but nobody listens to me. Nobody listens to me. But now they do. And I, I sometimes I'm kind of surprised. But because I've been following these moral precepts since 1989, if you will, probably before a long time people were born, um, it does work. It changes your the perception of who you are to other people. And of course, it changes your own personal perception to who you are, to yourself. You know that you're somebody who follows the rules and never does harm. And when you do that, other people know that as well. So, and that's another sense of power is your personal power. Um, you know, your reputation, trust, people like you, people, there's many benefits that are listed. I mean, I could do a whole talk about all of the benefits from following the, the moral precepts. But, you know, the first uh, retreats I did, um, we would say the precepts once during the retreat, and then that, that would be the end of it. And later they'd say, well, now you can give up all the precepts and go home. And I said, wait, what? <laughs> um, what does that mean? Well, does that mean we can go and harm people? And do No, no, you don't want to do that. Well, what does it mean? Well, you don't have to be attached to these rules. So that was a, a wrong understanding um, of those retreats. Uh, that that just didn't work. You know, here we say, uh, and Bhante has been famous for saying, somebody asked him, well, how long do we have to keep the precepts? And he said, well, you can start with 100 years and go up from there. So in other, in other words, forever. But, you know, if you break one, you're going to break one. Forgive yourself. And take it again for the rest of your life. It's a very powerful thing to take precepts because it is said that if you die and you're on your five precepts, you'll be reborn in heaven in some celestial realm. Why? Because everybody in heaven is following precepts. They're moral good people up there, over there, wherever that is. And the people in the hell realms didn't follow them. Now, you don't have to believe any of that stuff, but just in case it's true, and upon death, you go, whoa, there is life uh, after death, then you're ready, and you've done what needs to be done. This has been very interesting indeed, David. Thank you. My last question on it, there is a link made in Indic religion more broadly between moral continents, precepts, and well, potency of various types. Yes, a peaceful mind, free from disturbances and so on, but also a link between moral continence and Siddhi. That's, that is a link that's drawn in Indic religion quite often. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, it, if one can strategically avoid breaking precepts so as to reduce the disturbances of the mind and therefore progress in one's meditation uh, practice and in general just have less disturbance can one that's a sort of defensive precept sort of thing can one aggressively uh, invest virtue for some sort of uh, karmic uh, reward or to accrue some sort of potency i'm thinking for example of those practices like life release practices where people will take uh, an animal or so that's going to be eaten or 
some somehow processed and buy that animal and then release it. So you sort of saved the life of an, you know, they, that's a life right. practice that's done yeah, in certain yeah. traditions and so on. So there are these sorts of ways in which people attempt to invest virtue for various different payoffs. Although I think in that sort of a context, often one will dedicate that virtue to some sort of higher cause of enlightenment for all beings and so on. I'm wondering, uh, in your view, is there a, a way of, I suppose, investing ahead of time virtue in aggressive investing rather than defensive defensive uh, investing of of the precepts and virtue um well everything that we do will have some result in the future and investing ahead of time i you know you know every we the future is in front of us so we want our future to be good i mean i'm i'm not sure are you talking about investing certain certain actions to create certain results? Is yes. Which, yeah. Well. <sighs> or or to obtain certain powers, for example, like uh, power of effective huh? speech. Uh, well, it was, you know, it was said that the Buddha was the, f um, whenever he spoke, he spoke exactly what he needed to hear. And it was exactly timely. And there was never uh, extra extra words or things going off the subject. Was just what was needed at that time. Um, you know, whenever the Buddha did things, it was it was just exactly right. Um, you know, he he had many many times of developing parami or his good qualities. Um, but there was never a particular development for psychic powers. However, you know, there there's a story of Anuruddha who had the divine eye and he could see, I think he could see like 10,000 world systems. He could see what was happening. He could hear what was happening. Well, it didn't just happen. It was a result of something that he had done in the past. And what he had done was a, uh, a past Buddha uh, was in the dark. And he, he needed some light. And uh, as a past life, uh, Anuruddha had put oil oil lamps around him, and he had given him some light. And as a result of that, uh, Anuruddha, in the life with the Buddha, had this incredible divine eye. I mean, he was the foremost in seeing um, into the in, you know other world systems hearing from other planes and and all of that sort of thing so there was a an action and a result and sometimes people think well if i meditate i'm just going to get all these psychic powers or why don't i have all these psychic powers it doesn't work like that uh you need to do something to uh earn these powers now we don't necessarily promote doing things to do that sort of thing but giving is a big one um if you want a successful future life you know give give to the sangha in, in however many ways you can uh so giving there's three things that you want to do there's there's dana or giving there is the sila or morality and that's following the precepts and that helps your meditation, which is bhavana, which is the meditation practice. So you do all of those things, and whatever your future results, they're going to, they're going to be good. We don't need to worry about that. You're going to be happy with whatever they are. Um, there is a, one sutta which describes, um, let's see, what is it? Your ability to stay in a jhana is dependent upon dana having given in the past and letting go of your resources as uh, uh, to other people and to help people that's gives you your ability to stay into the states and that's you know it's an interesting takeaway but um if you think about it when you let go of something of yours you are letting go with your mind and the the state of the jhana is really a letting go of the hindrances. 
and it's a unification. So it is a most of it is letting go. And so when you let go of your wealth and let go and all of this, and that comes back to help with your meditation. Um, there's an actual sutta about that very thing. Um, so, you know, giving is powerful. It not only affects your future and get all the goodies and the celestial mansions, and that's all nice, but it helps your meditation here and now. Because when you reflect on what you've given, you're happy. And sometimes people use um, what they've given as to bring up the loving kindness and bring up a kind of a sympathetic joy it, it, when they first start sitting. They go, oh, yeah, I gave that to that person. So you reflect on that and you rejoice in that. And and and, and so that brings up a, a feeling of happiness. So all these things are actually coming back to the meditation and you're developing your meditation by following all of these other things. So everything's helping it, but it's all going toward the meditation to attain Nibbana and the elimination of craving and the elimination of suffering. Thank you. This has been a very interesting episode indeed. I wonder, is there anything left to say on this subject of forgiveness meditation in particular, or perhaps something else that comes to mind about the role of morality uh, and moral precepts? Of course, like you said, you could give very many long talks on it, but anything that comes to mind immediately before we wrap things up? Um, I'm sure something will come to mind after we wrap things up. <laughs> no, I don't have anything further right now. <laughs> I'm, I think I'm tapped out for, for the moment. So, yeah, hopefully it's been helpful. David Johnson, thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.